Pediatric heart transplantation is standard of care and continues to evolve in order to address the challenges of the diverse group of patients that reach end-stage heart failure during childhood. In the next 20 minutes, I hope to provide a brief overview of the current state of pediatric cardiac transplantation within the framework of this special issue on heart transplantation. The small numbers of pediatric patients that approach end-stage heart failure and follow a trajectory towards heart transplantation continue to challenge us with regards to acquiring the information to develop evidence-based or best practices and or to study the effect of any new diagnostic or therapeutic strategies on outcomes. There are two main sources of multicenter data for children following listing for transplantation and after transplantation. The Registry of the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant and the Pediatric Heart Transplant Study. The ISHLT currently contains over 14,000 transplants worldwide and PHDS currently includes over 7,000 listed and 5,500 transplanted patients. The number of pediatric heart transplants reported to the ISHLT registry has increased over time with 442 in 2004, 586 in 2014, and most recently 684 in 2015. The age distribution of the recipients has remained stable since the mid-1990s with a predominance in the infant age range and then the adolescent age range. Teenagers, shown here in green, account for half the recipients in Europe and other areas of the world, whereas in North America, proportionally more infants, shown here in purple, undergo transplantation. The primary diagnosis prior to transplantation have evolved over time. Congenital heart disease, shown here in green, has remained the commonest underlying diagnosis in infants younger than a year of age, though the proportion of infant recipients with cardiomyopathy, shown here in yellow, has doubled to almost 40% in the most recent era. In older patients, cardiomyopathy in yellow remains the predominant diagnosis, seen here for ages 1 to 5 years, here for 6 to 10 years, and here for 11 to 17 years of age. Primary diagnosis also shows geographic variation with congenital heart disease in green and retransplantation in red, both more common in North America compared with Europe and the rest of the world. The overall waitlist mortality is 17% from the largest registry-based analysis, but ranged from 5 to 39% based on multiple factors, most notably those listed here. The greatest donor shortage and highest waitlist mortality is for infants with congenital heart disease. The use of ventricular assist devices as a bridge to transplant in the pediatric population has continued to increase significantly and currently over 50% of pediatric patients beyond the infant age group are transplanted from VAD support. There remains a predominance of VAD use in patients with cardiomyopathy compared to congenital heart disease as illustrated in this slide. Of note, in this era of more widespread availability and use of VADs, a recent analysis from the UNOS database has shown a 50% reduction in waitlist mortality with a four times higher likelihood of surviving to transplantation, seen here in the green line. These patients can often be mobile and undergo physical and nutritional rehabilitation while awaiting transplantation, 
which has likely contributed to the reduced waitlist mortality without compromising post-transplant survival, which, shown here in the green line, is equivalent to patients with no mechanical circulatory support prior to transplantation, or the red line. This is in contrast to the significantly worse outcomes from ECMO support, seen here in the blue line. Looking at post-transplant outcomes, the most recent analysis from the ICHLT registry shows a median survival of 22.3 years for those less than one year of age at transplantation, 18.4 years for those one to five years, 14.4 years for those six to 10 years, and 13.1 years for those greater than 11 years of age at transplantation. These numbers continue to improve almost annually. Remarkably, survival to 10 years in the most recent era, conditional on survival to one year post-transplant, is now 83% for all age groups less than 10 years at transplantation. Graft failure, rejection, infection, and cardiac allograft vasculopathy continue to be the major causes of death within the first five years post-transplant. In the current era, ABO incompatible heart transplantation is accepted as standard of care, both from a waitlist mortality and a post-transplant survival perspective. Multiple publications have now shown equivalent outcomes for ABO incompatible heart transplantation, including rejection, comorbidities, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and graft survival. From an immune perspective, the observations about production of donor specific isohemagglutinins, or lack thereof, have provided insight and impetus for further study into mechanisms of B cell tolerance. Sensitization to HLA antigens now plays a key role in the decision-making around organ allocation and acceptance. Solid phase assays are able to detect anti-HLA antibodies with a high sensitivity, but applying this knowledge clinically has proved difficult as the presence of the antibody in and of itself does not mean that it is detrimental to the graft. The PHTS registry was evaluated for outcomes of sensitized versus non-sensitized recipients and one year after listing, of those with a PRA of less than 10%, 76% were transplanted and 9% deceased, shown here in the top left graph, versus 57% and 19% for those with a PRA greater than 50% shown here in the bottom left graph. For those that were transplanted, a PRA less than 10% had a 90% one-year survival versus 73% with a PRA greater than 50%, shown here in the graph on the right-hand side. Waiting for an HLA-compatible donor increases the risk of dying on the waiting list, while accepting a donor to which the recipient is sensitized leads to a poorer post-transplant outcome. However, a decision model analysis to try to balance these two competing risks has demonstrated that taking the first available organ provides the best outcomes overall. Given the importance of sensitization in the current era, the outcomes of transplanting across a positive cross-match are currently being explored in a prospective multi-institutional observational cohort study assessing the impact of pre-transplant sensitization called the Clinical Trials in Organ Transplantation in Children 60% of patients were sensitized, but only 11% of those had a positive crossmatch. Patients with a positive crossmatch had a higher incidence of AMR and ACR, but there was no difference in death, retransplantation, 
or rejection with hemodynamic compromise. With the ongoing improvement in survival following transplantation, there has been the need to develop protocols and practices to screen for and to minimize morbidities related to chronic immunosuppression, in addition to promote graft longevity. As seen here, there are many center-specific protocols for maintenance immunosuppression with collegial debates around the optimal regimen. One interesting observation has been the increase over time in induction therapy currently used in 71% of pediatric heart transplant recipients, but without impact on overall survival as illustrated here. Tacrolimus and MMF remain the most common combination of maintenance immunosuppression at hospital discharge. Cerolimus or everolimus use in pediatrics remains very low at less than 2% at hospital discharge, but increasing to 19% by five years post-transplant. Steroid use has also decreased over time with increasing adoption of steroid withdrawal and steroid avoidance protocols. Much still needs to be learned about the significance of either pre-existing or newly detected donor-specific antibodies, or DSAs, post-transplant. These may be transient, in which case, especially if early in the post-transplant course, may be of little significance. If they are persistent, they are associated with worse graft survival. In the CTOTC trial, one-third of patients developed newly detected donor-specific antibodies in the first year post-transplant, mostly within the first six weeks, implying that memory responses may predominate over true de novo DSA production. In the absence of pre-transplant DSA, Patients with newly detected DSA had significantly more acute cellular rejection, but not antibody-mediated rejection, and there was no impact on graft and patient survival in the first year post-transplant. Acute rejection remains an important cause of morbidity and mortality after transplantation. Standardized grading scales from ISHLT exist for biopsy reporting. For ACR, Grade 0 indicates no rejection, grade 1R mild rejection, grade 2R moderate rejection, and grade 3R severe rejection. More recently, to aid in the diagnosis and treatment of AMR, ISHLT also developed a pathology-based AMR grading system. The risk of rejection is highest in the first year post-transplant, but data from both the PHTS and ISHLT have shown an overall decline in rejection even during the first year post-transplant, as illustrated in the purple bars. Both registries show that treated rejection in the first year post-transplant decreases long-term survival. An antibody-mediated rejection has been associated with reduced short-term survival. Coronary allograft vasculopathy is a leading cause of death beyond three years after transplantation. Diagnosis is highly dependent on the type and frequency of surveillance post-transplant, which is highly variable. Overall freedom from coronary allograft vasculopathy in the ICHLT registry is 40% by 17 years post-transplant, but does vary by age, with infants, shown here in the purple line, having the highest freedom from CAV, and adolescents in green having the lowest. And freedom from CAV is one of the few things that is impacted upon by induction therapy, shown here in the red line. Unfortunately, once CAV is evident angiographically, short-term mortality is high. So what about retransplantation? The challenge remains predicting when to consider retransplantation. 
In a PHTS analysis aimed at validating the ISHLT grading system for CAV, an increased risk of graft loss in the setting of CAV was verified with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%, right atrial pressure greater than 12 millimeters of mercury, and or a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. Ultimately, Patients with moderate to severe CAV and evidence of graft dysfunction may require reconsideration for retransplantation. This graph illustrates the difference in survival between patients undergoing a primary transplant compared to retransplantation. Given organ donor shortages and ongoing waitlist mortality, controversy remains regarding the role of retransplantation in light of the decreased long-term survival. Looking at retransplantation in red, we've already seen the geographic and age-related differences in retransplantation, which is very rare in infants, as seen here, compared to adolescents, as seen here. Survival following retransplantation nears that of primary transplantation only when retransplantation occurs at five years or more after the primary transplant, shown here in the blue line, compared to shorter time intervals, and this difference remains significant on multivariable analysis. Another more common comorbidity is renal dysfunction. Late renal dysfunction continues to be a potential risk after heart transplantation in children, with some children progressing to dialysis and or renal transplant. Looking at functional status, the vast majority of children who survive at least one year post-heart transplant have an excellent functional status. Children and adolescents with intellectual disability have been shown to have no difference in survival outcomes with improvement in functional status post-heart transplant, raising awareness of and supporting a shift in the historical practice of considering intellectual disability as a relative contraindication to transplantation. An awareness of and efforts to mitigate non-adherence are a significant part of the management of pediatric heart transplant recipients especially during adolescence. The adolescent age range itself is independently associated with worse survival, with non-adherence being linked to late rejection and to high rates of death in adolescence. Finally, outcomes, especially rejection and graft loss, have been associated with a suboptimal transition process. Transition needs to be a planned process that addresses the medical, psychological, and educational needs of adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and mental conditions. So in conclusion, pediatric heart transplantation is standard of care for children with end-stage heart failure. The diverse age range, diagnoses, and practice variations continue to challenge the development of evidence-based practices and new technologies. Outcomes in the most recent era are excellent. The biggest gap impacting both waitlist and overall survival is availability of mechanical support options for infants and patients with single ventricle physiology. Pediatric heart transplantation continues to evolve in order to address the challenges of the diverse group of patients that reach end-stage heart failure during childhood. Thank you for your attention.